Hello, thank you for joining the Imatest Medical Imaging Webinar. My name is Henry Korn. I am the Chief Product Officer of Imatest. I am joined by Alex Schwartz, our Hardware Engineering Manager, and Ian Longton, our Imaging Science Engineer. Today, we're going to be talking about standards and challenges in testing the image quality of medical imaging devices, test equipment that Imatest produces that can help facilitate that goal, uh, test charts that can work with those systems, and analysis software and services that we offer. At the end, we'll do a question and answer session. We're going to start by talking to you about the medical imaging standards and challenges. Uh, there's many standards that Imatest is involved with. Uh, the uh, photography-related standards from ISO, uh, there's a wide range of these. These are uh, oriented towards specific image quality factors. Uh, and we uh, will go over some of a selection of these standards uh, in this presentation. Uh, the IEEE standards uh, are more related to particular applications. Uh, and while we're, we don't have a medical IEEE standard, there's many aspects that are relevant uh, to medical imaging. Uh, including uh, from the IEEE 1858, the uh, perceptual image quality, you know, having a human observer looking at uh, these images coming from these cameras uh, is, is often how these medical uh, imaging devices are used. Uh, the IEEE 2020 automotive image quality is more related to machine vision. Uh, and so uh, if you're using medical machine vision, which is maybe less common, uh, that might be, uh, some of those metrics might be relevant as well. Uh, there are some standards um, that are specifically uh, sort of medically oriented, uh, including these ISO 8600 uh, standards. Uh, we'll go over those at the uh, near the end of the, the talk. Uh, there's resolution, dynamic range, visual noise, and uh, perceptual imaging uh, standards that are that are relevant. Uh, probably the most popular standard uh, for sharpness or resolution, also known as spatial frequency response, or MTF, um, is the ISO 12233. And uh, there are many different patterns that are included in this standard. And depending on how your system is processed, uh, certain patterns may more be more or less appropriate. The uh, the slanted edge target or feature on these targets is is something that uh, was it introduced with the 2000 version of the ISO 12233. Uh, this is the updated um, the 2017 updated version of the target that you see in this image, and uh, there's actually a 2023 update uh, which is coming soon, or it's been published, but we don't have the chart just yet. We should later this year. Uh, so the slanted edge uh, measurement is something that is, uh, is highly affected by, by sharpening and signal processing. And so if you really care about the underlying quality of your lens and sensor, you should try to disable the, the sharpening in your ISP or use raw images to test resolution using the slanted edge. If you want to test perceived image sharpness, it's fine because you know, the the more the, the the edge is sharpened, the more that score is going to go up, and that will correlate with perceptual image quality. Uh, so the real advantage of this is uh, very high spatial precision. You can look at a very localized area of your your lens, and it's also very fast calculation. Uh, Some another disadvantage uh, besides the uh, susceptibility to sharpening is that. Uh, you're only measuring one angle of MTF for each edge. And we, we often address that just by having um, orthogonal edges uh, that are next to each other. So we can get an understanding of vertical and horizontal or sagittal and tangential MTF, uh, depending on where you are in the image. The hyperbolic wedge is a feature uh, which we include on our version of the ISO 12233 target. Uh, and this is something which is traditionally used for the TV lines measurement, uh, which uh, we use uh, the units of line widths per picture height 
uh, as the the resolution units for uh, for the for the wedge, which is comparable to TV lines. Uh, now, the the advantage of this target is that it's less impacted by signal processing than the slanted edge. Um, you know, you can't. You know, once you've lost uh, these the ability to see these bars uh, by having them blurred out, um, the signal processing is not uh, not easily going to recover that lost data. Uh, so it's kind of a little bit more difficult to to kind of cheat the test with signal processing. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, it is only one angle, uh, like the the slanted edge, and um, there's uh, not very good spatial locality. To this target, uh, because it kind of is this long uh, feature, uh, you may have one end of the feature that's further out from the center of the image than the other end of the feature, and so that may mean that you know your your sharpness changes as you as you go to different points in the wedge. So this is often used. Uh, while while Imitest does have an automatic way of measuring this target. Um, it's often used for subjective analysis where, you know, people are looking at the target, looking for the, the, the point on the target where the, the bars disappear. Uh, and, uh, well, that's easy to work around by using a software analysis of this. Uh, really, the biggest dis disadvantage is if you have a very sharp system and there's, you, there's a sampling phase issue, where if your um, your wedges are kind of aligned with the the uh, the pixels in your sensor, then uh, you're going to get, and you have a very sharp lens. Um, you'll you'll see a very clear image of those lens. But if you offset them by half a pixel, uh, everything will disappear, uh, and that's just the the nature of these sort of um, modulated targets like this. So. Um, you can get around that by either not having such a sharp lens or uh, looking at multiple wedges and maybe picking um, the best performance. And you know, if some some of them get zeroed out, then you could skip those or ignore them. Uh, the other target in ISO 12233 is the sinusoidal semen star. This is uh, uh, the advantage of this one is it measures all different angles of MTF. Uh, it is less impacted by signal processing than slanted edge, uh, but the disadvantage is it's a it's a large target. It um, has kind of low spatial precision, and um, it takes a, quite a while to calculate this. So you know if you're doing manufacturing testing and a real time analysis, this is probably not the best one to use. Um, there's also some production issues on uh, making this target um, because it uses um, kind of graduated tones. We can't use the unitone chrome on glass process to produce this target, uh, and that's a that's a process that's very popular for medical imaging systems. Um, there is a um, kind of an extension to ISO one two two three three, which is a part of the IEEE eighteen fifty eight standard, which is called acutins. Uh, this is a measure of perceived image sharpness uh, in a print or a display, and it um, this is derived from the MTF. Uh, uh, multiplied by the contrast sensitivity function of the human observer, uh, which peaks around five cycles degree per degree. Uh, and the, um, the contrast sensitivity is function is based on the viewing distance, how, how close you are uh, to the display, uh, and then the size of the display. And that, that is uh, what determines your viewing angle, uh, for how much that display subtends your eye. And uh, so that is, um, you know, when it comes to like an, an endoscope system where you have a monitor, you have a you have a doctor that's looking at the monitor. You can consider that to be uh, the viewing distance and, and viewing angle, um, and then this can be used to come up with a uh, a measure of sharpness that is weighted for the frequencies that are most uh, noticeable to the human vision system. Uh, another part of the um, IEEE 1858 uh, metrics, uh, which I think is uh, applicable, uh, is uh, the texture blur metric. And uh, I bring this up because um, one of the uh, members of the, uh, the 1858 uh, working group is um, a part of the FDA. And, and they, so they've been working on 
um, that's Quan Zhen Wang. He's been working on uh, improving this standard. Uh, there uh, is a lot of kind of texture in biological images. So I think that's what led, led him to um, want to work on this. Uh, so the revision of uh, CPIQ or 1858 uh, that was just published uh, a few days ago has an improved texture metric, uh, which uh, works to kind of separate it further from um, noise measurements uh, by, by signaling, averaging out multiple images. Uh, the issue with the, the earlier version of this texture measurement standard and also the ISO standard is that um, the uh, you're subjected to, if you have a really low light situation with um, high noise, uh, that noise could be potentially confused with texture. And so the signal averaging uh, in this new revision of this standard makes it so that um, the noise is kind of removed and you get a pure measure of texture. And it's also resistant to kind of geometric distortion, which is nice. Uh, so these are some of the challenges in doing kind of close-up uh, measurements of endoscopes, uh, which we're mostly talking about endoscopes, but also microscopes are, are things that can be tested uh, with Imatest uh, tools. Uh, so your built-in light source uh, on the endoscope, uh, uh, typically there's, a, there's an LED or some sort of light source incorporated with your, your scope. And um, that can, if you're using a, a, a test target that's highly reflective, uh, well, you're going to get reflections off the test target. And if you're trying to measure where one of those reflections is, it's going to kind of corrupt the measurement ability. So uh, usually we recommend kind of disabling the built-in light source if you can. Sometimes you can't disable the built-in light source. You have to have to use it. And you know, I guess if you're interested in color uh, reproduction, you want to kind of use that built-in source. Uh, and so, uh, in that case, you might want to use a, a reflective target, which is difficult to get an adequately precise target. Uh, in that case, um, chroma, the um, the transmissive targets are much sharper, uh, which we'll go into detail about later. Um, so the the test charts uh, need need to be small. A lot of a lot of the charts we have are, you know, the standard charts are much larger. They don't fill the field of view of a medical device. Um, and we also see some really low resolution cameras in some of these medical devices, like 400 or 200 pixels square. Uh, some of these targets were designed for higher resolution cameras and the target design may need to be simplified for some of those really low res systems. Uh, Optical distortion, if you have it in your system, uh, is always something that can uh, be challenging for measurements. Uh, we have a lot of things that kind of help to compensate for that distortion if it exists, uh, but it still is something that could potentially disrupt the test. Um, and then signal processing is really the big one. Uh, if you've applied uh, sharpening noise reduction, uh, that can uh, disrupt some of the measurements. Um, I'll talk briefly about the uh, process of clearing a medical device. Uh, this is something that we've helped uh, several companies with. Um, well, with regards to the image quality related parts of this FDA 501k device clearance. Uh, so this, this clearance process involves uh, comparing a proposed device uh, with, a, with a similar predicate device that's already on the market. Or if there's the device that you're uh, trying to put on the market is new or significantly different, um, then you have to kind of demonstrate its quality with controlled studies, uh, and you know either reproduce, you know, kind of say that hey, we're as good as this predicate device or better, uh, and um, that's kind of what the FDA is looking for to um, clear a device for being put on the market. Uh, so. Uh, including image quality metrics for these devices is a, is a good way of kind of giving objective evidence of the performance of your medical device uh, with regards to imaging at least. Uh, so our consultants can help you to optimize the image quality aspects of your submission. And uh, so we'd be happy to uh, help you with that if you need help. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Alex Schwartz to talk about test equipment. Thank you, Henry. Uh, 
Are you able to enable my video streaming? Yes, I think I. Uh, it looks like I'm not figuring this out, so maybe we should just. OK, I'll get started. Uh, my name is Alex Schwartz, and I'm the hardware engineering manager at Imitest. I've been with Imitest for seven years, and I'm very excited to be announcing the new Benchtop test stand. So the Benchtop test stand, or BTS as we also call it, uh, was designed with endoscopes in mind and was designed uh, with feedback also from uh, the endoscope testing community, both engineers testing endoscopes and uh, using pre-existing fixtures that have been on the market. Um, so we call the optical axis the Z-axis. Uh, our design uses uh, translation of the, uh, the target for the Z-axis and the X-axis and then it also has translation in the vertical axis or Y axis for your endoscope, as well as tilt and rotation for the endoscope. Um, with our benchtop test stand, you can test multiple targets at once. Uh, seen here is a Imatest light box with a chrome on glass target and a color gauge target. So they're on the same horizontal plane and you can quickly go from a sharpness transmissive test to a reflective color test. Uh, we offer this design in both manual and motorized configurations. Um, seen here is the fully motorized version. Uh, you can also have just the optical axis motorized or uh, in the manual version, we have a digital scale to be able to quickly find uh, the distances that you're looking for. And you're, allowed, you're able to use this design with a variety of testing devices, uh, both you know, cameras with quarter 20s, uh, cameras with custom mounts, and then of course, endoscopes and other medical devices. Uh, we also are able to mount light boxes, light panels, and our new magnetic reflective chart mounting module, which we'll look at in the next slides. And our price ranges, go from 7,000 to 22,000, depending on the level of motorization and the add-ons that you choose. So seen here is the endoscope module with the angled plate. And our angled plate allows you to test endoscopes with angled tips, uh, either 30 degrees or 70 degrees. And we have a zero millimeter to one meter working distance. Uh, we also have uh, 300 millimeters in x-axis adjustments and uh, a variety of mounting options for your device under test. Uh, the light box with two charts is shown here, but it can hold a variety of test targets, um, chrome on glass, film, is near, uh, even reflective targets as well. And uh, we, we want to keep the endoscopes fixed in place as much as possible just to reduce wear and to reduce um, the cable management on the customer side. So this slide shows our benchtop test stand ecosystem. Uh, you choose your base module, so you can either have the manual version, the motorized Z axis, or the fully motorized option. Um, then we also have an endoscope module add-on that is shown here in these images. And then we have the magnetic chart mounting system for reflective targets. And we are also able to support light boxes, uh, the size B light box, and then the size A or B light panel. Uh, we also have configurations for both testing stray light and uh, we have a target projector module for simulating long range testing of your device. Uh, those are shown at the bottom, and those both rely on the motorized gimbal for that, that sort of testing. 
Um, so we're going to show a four minute video showing all the features of the benchtop test stand. We are pleased to announce the new Imatest Benchtop Test Stand. The Benchtop Test Stand, or BTS, is an easy to use modular platform for image quality testing. The BTS significantly reduces the amount of space and time needed in your lab. Quickly test endoscopes and medical devices for sharpness, color accuracy, and more using the endoscope module. Perform transmissive testing with Imatest light boxes or light panels up to size B, available in a variety of color temperatures and NIR wavelengths. Transmissive chart substrates include LVT film, chromon glass, display trans, and our new Viz NIR technology. If you require custom test charts, please reach out to sales at imatest.com. Perform reflective testing using the optional magnetic chart mounting system. The manual BTS features a rail system for repeatable testing positions. The included digital readout allows for setting high precision test distances. Reflective chart substrates include inkjet on matte or semi-gloss and high resolution fiber photographic paper. The checkerboard photographic multi-size test chart is produced on a semi-matte photographic media. Use the inclinometer included with the magnetic chart mounting system to adjust the angle of your target. Conveniently store charts on the back of the magnetic chart mounting system. A laser engraved grid allows for repeatable chart alignment. Perform a variety of tests for endoscopes and endotherapy devices such as ISO 8600-3 which calls for determination of field of view and direction of view. Securely lock your positions in place with the included brakes. Perform long-range testing in a confined space using the target projector module. This module allows you to easily mount and align the One Stone target projector, CM10120, with the camera under test. A manually adjustable diopter barrel allows you to set projected target distances from 1 meter to infinity with a 10 degree inspectable field of view. Create an isolated image quality testing lab in any room using the benchtop curtain fixture. Pairing the Imatest motorized gimbal with the target projector module allows you to test the sharpness of your camera at different projected distances across the entire imaging plane, even for cameras with a horizontal field of view beyond 180 degrees. The stray light or flare module requires the Imatest motorized gimbal which allows you to accurately set the illumination angle, including angles where the light source is outside of the camera field of view. The Imatest Stray Light LED source projects an image of a small point-like source as a uniform collimated beam for controlled testing. This light source has been designed to reduce internal reflections or halo by underfilling the collimating lens with light. The projected source has an angular diameter similar to the sun, allowing for detailed characterization of all forms of stray light, including diffraction spikes, ghosting, and veiling glare. The adjustable brightness and large beam diameter accommodates a wide variety of sensors and camera sizes. Imatest software can be used to compute objective measurements such as normalized stray light from the captured images along with a variety of plots and summary statistics for benchmarking. For more information, please visit imatest.com slash BTS. Thank you for watching that video. Uh, so just going on to more details about the light box. Um, the light box is really for HDR or contrast resolution testing. Uh, it includes rails for aligning your charts uh, to a repeatable position. And we offer the light box in both single channel or two channels with a mixed mode. And those are offered in 
uh, anywhere from 3100 Kelvin up to 6500 Kelvin, as well as 940 and 850 nanometers. Uh, the light boxes range from 30 to 10,000 lux, and we also have the high 100,000 lux option. Um, we have both VIZ and NIR, and the light box boasts 95% uniformity, so it can be used for uniformity and blemish testing as well. The Imitest light panel is a slimmer, uh, less expensive version, um, and it still has 90 to 95% uniformity, but it does have less intensity. So the Lux ranges from 100 to 1,000 Lux. Uh, these are available in single wavelengths or, um, or uh, Kelvin or white levels. So uh, we offer anywhere from 3,100 to 6,500 on those as well. And we also offer the 90, 950 and 850 nanometer options. The benchtop test stand is designed to hold uh, light boxes size B and light panels size A and B. And I will pass the mic to Ian to talk about test charts. All right, thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna cover some information about the various test chart options we have available for uh, medical device testing, um, as well as really any other Im imaging system. Um, but our uh, test charts can be kind of broken down into two camps. There's reflective and transmissive charts. Um, now, this has to do with the actual media that the chart is printed on or made out of. Um, these uh, different materials have different properties. And um, so we do have different patterns that are available in both reflective and transmissive. Some patterns only in one, uh, either transmissive or re or re reflective. Um, but mostly that has to do with the actual properties of the material itself. So re reflective charts, uh, reflective media is kind of what it sounds like. It, it, um, it uses light from an external source that bounces off the chart and goes back into the camera. Um, so for reflective, uh, reflective options, we have two different inkjet um, materials available, both matte and semi-gloss. Um, these are... Um, uh, an important thing to keep in mind is that the inkjet options are the lowest resolution option. Um, I'll cover that more in a few slides here. Um, but for now, just keep in mind that um, inkjet may, may not have enough resolution for a lot of medical systems, um, especially at the sizes that we're talking about. Um, photographic paper, however, is another re reflective option that is a lot of higher resolution. Um, and again, we'll talk about that more in a second. And then for transmissive, that involves a backlight. That's light passing through the chart into the camera. Um, and so we have a few different options for those. They're all transparent. Uh, we have an inkjet option for that, just like for re reflective, as well as uh, two different types of film and uh, material that we call visnier. It's a mylar kind of um, material. And then we also have chrome on glass, which is a piece, of, uh, a piece of glass with actual chrome printed on it. So uh, these next slides here are gonna show kind of a close up when I'm, of what I mean when I talk about the uh, various resolutions of the different materials. So for inkjet, this is that image on the left there shows a close up of a slanted edge printed on a matte inkjet, uh, a matte inkjet chart. As you can see, a lot of the pi the uh, uh, fiber of the paper itself is visible as well as some of the dots of pigment. Um, so uh, it is the lowest resolution material available. The strengths of it though, is that it's really easy to customize, right? We can print just about any pattern that we want on to inkjet. It's very flexible in terms of size. We're really limited only by the uh, width of our printers that we can print. So we can print, you know, extremely small and up to extremely big. Um, usually they're the most useful for longer test distances because of that uh, size flexibility. So that really lower, relatively lower resolution is less of an issue when you're talking about a bigger chart. And that edge is using more of that material, which has a, a relatively uh, higher resolution than a smaller chart of the same pattern. So for now, it's worth keeping in mind that most medical systems um, 
an inkjet chart is not really going to be a viable solution just because of the sizes that are required for a lot of medical imaging devices. We're talking about small imaging areas. So a small imaging area means a small chart, means not a lot of areas covered by a given uh, chart feature. So it's uh, uh, relatively less sharp on an inkjet media than it would be on others. Um, but it's definitely something to keep in mind if you have a longer test distance. Photographic paper, uh, like I mentioned, is also a reflective, uh, a, a reflective option. Um, it is uh, silver halide paper like you would find in a dark room. So it is an actual photographic process in the paper itself. Um, it is much higher resolution than an inkjet print. Uh, large sizes are also available, but we can also do smaller ones. Um, when I say it's a higher resolution, we're talking about at least two times as sharp as inkjet. Uh, we do have a new chart that we've come out with recently that I'll talk about in a few slides here that is printed on this photographic paper. Uh, so this can be a great option if you do need to use a reflective system because a lot of medical devices have a built-in light source that either can't be disabled or it's important to test using that built-in light source, right? So a re the, so that necessitates a reflective uh, chart and so photographic paper can be a great option for that. So for photographic film, this is the first of our transmissive uh, chart options. Um, we have two different types of black and white and color. Both of these, the process called the LVT film. Um, basically, it's uh, uh, same kind of film or really similar to what you would have in a camera back in the day, right? So this is a, a photographic process film, much higher resolution. There is a difference in process and material for the black and white and the color versions. The color is a little bit sharper, uh, but the black and white is available in kind of bigger sizes. The size is limited by the, you know, the physical sheet of the film itself. Um, but on the small end, we can always print something smaller on it. It's fairly flexible in terms of what we can print on these film charts. They are significantly higher resolution than an inkjet. Um, one of the other big advantages is the, the inherent dynamic range of that material is pretty wide. And they can also be, uh, because they're transmissive, we can layer them on top of each other to increase that uh, density, effectively increasing the dynamic range. Uh, we'll talk more about dynamic range charts in a few slides here. Uh, chrome on glass uh, is, like I mentioned, a piece of soda lime glass with uh, actual chrome, the actual metal deposited on it. Um, this means that the edges that we're able to achieve with this process are extremely sharp. Uh, there, It is by far the uh, uh, highest resolution option available um, because it's an actual physical edge printed on that piece of glass. Um, so it's excellent for resolution testing, especially with the slanted edge. One of the drawbacks, though, is that because it is a physical material that's deposited onto this glass, uh, there's no tonal variance or color. So it is a unitone process, right? So we can't do different colors of chrome, um, and we also can't really stack up different densities of it. So it is unitone, but extremely sharp, and we can make these extremely small as well. The printing process for these allows for uh, a very high degree of precision at extremely small sizes, and I'll show some more of that in a few slides here. Uh, but chrome on glass is by far the highest resolution option um, in all of our charts, including the transmissive ones. So this slide here shows a few of the key uh, chart patterns. So a lot of these patterns, a lot of these, these different charts can be printed on either reflective or transmissive media, all those different ones I just talked about. Some of them, due to the nature of the measurement or the nature of the chart, it can only be printed on a single type of material. Um, so there are some caveats there. Those first two, SFR Plus and ESFR ISO, those are really good kind of multi-purpose charts. Those, those charts provide a lot of different measurements from a single image. Um, kind of like a Swiss Army knife, though, they uh, because they're more generalized, um, the uh, there's better versions of each of those measurements in a more specialized chart, right? But those two charts give you all of them at once. These other charts are some of those more specialized ones. They offer, you know, a single or two or three measurements from that chart, but they do a really good job of those specific measurements. Um, uh, so depending on what you need to measure, uh, how deep you need to dive into the given metrics that you're trying to measure of your system, that'll help inform uh, which chart pattern makes the most sense 
And then also coupled with the chart materials that I just talked about. Um, one to keep in mind is that uh, X-Rite Color Checker on the top there, it's actually Calibri Calibrite now. Um, the company has changed hands a few times, but the, that Calibrite Color Checker um, is kind of the industry standard for color testing, right? But we uh, we know that that's only really available in the one eight by 10 size. There are some smaller versions available, but they're not quite small enough. So we do have some other color charts that are going to be really helpful for uh, the smaller imaging areas of medical devices. Um, same thing with those dynamic range charts, the 36 patch dynamic range and the contrast resolution chart. Um, those There's some uh, caveats there as well that we'll cover in a few slides. This slide here is showing uh, some multi-size targets. So uh, when we say multi-size, we mean there are multiple sizes of the same chart pattern printed on a single um, on a single piece of material. So like a single sheet of film, a single sheet of photographic paper, it's going to have multiple sizes. These can be really helpful if you're working across a range of working distances or a range of field of view. Uh, fields of view, different devices, different distances through focus testing, uh, things like that. So rather than needing to get multiple different charts at different sizes, you can get a single one that includes multiple sizes within it. And then, of course, that re, re, re requires the ability to uh, translate the imaging device to be able to view the chart of a given size. But assuming that's possible, these multi-size charts are really handy. That one in the top right there, that checkerboard photographic, that's the one I alluded to earlier, um, our new chart that's printed on a photographic paper. So checkerboards are really handy because they can measure um, distortion extremely well. They're really good for measuring distortion. They can also, if you either tilt the chart or tilt the imaging device, now you have a bunch of slanted edges. So they can provide a really high density of sharpness measurements across the field of view. That photographic paper, like I mentioned, is pretty high resolution. So even at those smaller sizes, it can still be extremely useful for uh, sharpness, uh, distortion, and chromatic aberration measurements. Um, so that's a great chart to consider for a reflective source. A lot of these other ones are transmissive. Um, so the film and the chrome on glass charts are going to be transmissive, um, used with the backlight, same kind of idea, different sizes. And then those slides on those charts on the bottom there. Uh, there you, you can see there's the uh, ESFR ISO chrome on glass slide and the IAM 9C color slide. Um, those are both standard uh, uh, um, microscope slide sizes, the one by three inch microscope slide. So you can see there's little tiny charts printed on those. Those can be really helpful, not just for endoscopes, but also microscope uh, testing and characterization. Um, so then uh, um, those are the great things to keep in mind too. So uh, we can test a wide range of different, or rather we can accommodate a wide range of uh, imaging area sizes. This, uh, the uh, rest checker and color gauge charts, these are what I alluded to earlier inter for uh, color testing. So you'll notice that they have kind of a similar but different layout to that uh, Calibrite color checker chart. It is worth noting though, that those color patches are not printed. They are the actual Munsell color pigments. That's uh, the uh, same ones that are used in the uh, Calibrite chart. So they have the same nice wide gamut, a lot wider than you'd have using a, a inkjet chart. Um, they also include some features for resolution testing. You can see there's a slanted edges and um, hyperbolic, or uh, it might be hyperbolic, might be uh, some wedges there uh, for resolution testing as well. So you get those um, from a single image. And then the grayscale patches can provide you some noise and total response information. Um, so these can be really handy. And there's a penny there for scale. We can uh, source these from um, 45 millimeter height all the way down to nine and a half millimeters. So um, they can get pretty tiny. So they can be really useful uh, for uh, various medical devices. They are reflective as well. So you can use the built-in light source. So for dynamic range testing, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there are some things to consider. Um, this chart here is that ISO 21550 
um, ISO standard chart. So it is the one that's described in the standard. Um, you'll notice in the name of that standard, it was originally developed for uh, scanners, for, uh, uh, for characterizing um, um, electronic scanners. The same chart though, plays nice with our software. Our software can analyze it really well. Um, so you can use this chart for characterizing um, any other kind of imaging device, not just scanners, including medical ones. So um, you'll notice uh, from that image on the top there, the top right, it is a piece of 35 millimeter film, again, like you would use in a camera. So the size is pretty small um, and it has a range of optical densities from 0.1 to 4.0. So that equates to about a 78 decibel range um, from a, on a single piece of film. So uh, like I mentioned, our color tone module in the Imitest software can analyze this and give you lots of information about uh, SNR and the various patches, uh, what that total response curve looks like, as well as dynamic range. Um, so that's a, a handy one to keep in mind because of the size. It can uh, It's very well suited for a lot of, of uh, medical imaging systems. Um, however, the limitations of this would be that dynamic range, that 78 decibel range, as well as the orientation of those patches uh, you'll notice that they're not radial like they are in these next charts. So these, the 36 patch charts are kind of our standard, the uh, our uh, standard recommendation for dynamic range testing. You, uh, like I just said, those patches are arranged in a, in a radial fashion, which helps to mitigate the effects of uh, radi the uh, radial uh, fall off that we expect in really any imaging system. Um, um, they do have a much wider dynamic range as well. You'll notice that the highest one is up to 150 decibels. That's achieved by uh, stacking them, like I mentioned earlier. So we can achieve really any density we need to. Um, and uh, these are, though, only available in one size. And that's about an 8 by 10, 8 inch by 10 inch size um, for use with our light boxes. So Sometimes that's a little too big for our medical uh, for medical devices, but if your device can focus at a longer distance and or has a wider field of view, then you can get a, a, a good framing of this chart. This is going to enable you to get a really good understanding of the dynamic range and noise performance of your system. All right, and now... Uh, I will hand it back over to Henry to cover some of our software analysis and our service offerings. Thank you, Ian and Alex. Uh, so as far as the software licensing of the Imitest software, uh, we have uh, two different uh, types of software we provide. There's Imitest Master, which is a user interface uh, GUI uh, for um, kind of directly um, working with setting up the settings and uh, performing interactive analyses and uh, also working with um, direct connections to uh, cameras and testing them in real time. Uh, so uh, the uh, other version we have is a, a library version called Imitest IT. And this is for uh, automated testing, either in a lab or a manufacturing line. Um, it is able to acquire uh, directly from devices uh, as well. And um, so we have several licensing options for this. There's a, a kind of an annual subscription license. Uh, there is a perpetual license that costs a bit more. Um, we have um, uh, either a node locked, which is on one computer, or a floating license, which can uh, go between multiple computers um, automatically. Uh, so as far as you know, how uh, the Imitest uh, software workflow works, uh, you know, you start with kind of uh, loading your image into Imitest, and um, there is a automatic chart identification feature we have uh, recently added, and um, that will identify what type of target you have, and then you can go and uh, perform the analysis uh, and uh, then generate all the data and report outputs uh, that you're interested in, in a variety of formats. Uh, now I will talk about our test lab services offering. This is something uh, new for us. And uh, if you are not set up to do the testing in-house yet, uh, or you want to save your time or you know, test your competitors' devices, 
um, we would be very happy to uh, help you to um, perform some of your testing services for you and develop a statement of work, a, a test plan, and um, reports uh, uh, for whatever devices you're, um, you care about. Uh, so uh, we uh, can perform sensor evaluation, uh, hardware design, ISP tuning, and uh, benchmarking of all types of sensors and devices. Uh, so this is a um, kind of a one of these uh, sample reports uh, for test lab services. You can uh, scan the QR code if you want to pull this up. I've got it open here, and I'll just kind of uh, briefly take you through uh, what this report looks like. Um, and uh, let's see here, uh, view. Sorry here. Okay, so yeah, this is our report, and this is something uh, uh, new. Um, it's not yet in our software yet, but uh, at one point it will, or soon it will be. Uh, so um, this is our um, kind of all of the the table of contents and uh, description of how we've set up the test. Um, this test of this boroscope involves a field of view. Uh, sharpness or MTF testing. Uh, we used a um, a checkerboard target, um, moved to certain positions within the the field of view to satisfy the ISO eighty six hundred standard uh, requirements for um, this very uh, particular testing locations. Uh, so uh, this could also, if you had a, a target that filled the field of view, uh, you could perform this with kind of just one one exposure. Uh, but this is how we we tested this particular camera. Um, so um, the, we had a color accuracy uh, measurement here. Uh, uh, we we did a um, kind of irradiance measurement of the light source. Um, we performed a, a uniformity test using a, a, a light the uniform light box, a kind of point blank to the light box, putting the camera right up to it, so it's as uniform as possible. Uh, we performed a distortion test using the checkerboard and um, a field of view test. You can get you can get field of view from a checkerboard image or a variety of different image test targets. Uh, the ISO 8600-3 method A target uh, kind of lets you get your field of view without having to perform any sort of automated analysis. You can just kind of look at the concentric rings and see uh, see you know, roughly what your field of view is by those rings. Uh, so, uh, and that's, you know, in vertical, horizontal, and diagonal, you can measure that here. Uh, so uh, we have our um, edge and MTF um, sharpness reports. Um, we're looking at um, how many, uh, we're looking at peak MTF, um, MTF 50P, which is the, the spatial frequency um, normalized for sharpening, uh, where you've lost 50% of your, your contrast. Um, also, MTF area, which is um, accounts for many different uh, frequencies of MTF, uh, kind of integrated across uh, the uh, spatial frequencies up to the Nyquist frequency. Uh, we have um, the kind of MTF measurements from the individual points on the device. And um, you know, the detailed MTF curves uh, for each of these regions. Here you can see we've separated vertical and horizontal uh, MTFs from each other. And we repeat that for the other uh, areas on the image. Uh, so we do a color accuracy measurement. Uh, we're using the color gauge uh, target here. Uh, it, you know, we actually had a little bit of an exposure issue with this, and uh, I think this device had automatic exposure. And because of the kind of black surround on the target, I think it um, it hit saturation in quite a few uh, areas here. So this is uh, maybe an a, an indication that the auto exposure routine is suboptimal. Uh, you definitely, you know, if you want to really see good color accuracy, you don't want to hit saturation uh, on any of your uh, color patches. Um, so we did a saturation adjustment to get the 
uh, improved. Uh, um, we dropped the lux level actually from 255 to 5.7 in order to see what saturation would be uh, or what, what the, the measurement would, the color accuracy would be in the non-saturated situation. Uh, if you had ability to lock your exposure, you might be able to do this some other way besides going to a lower light level. Um, we did a uniformity measurement using the flat field analysis module, and um, we get luminance contour plots. Um, we did our distortion measurement from the checkerboard um, and looking at the distortion contours across the image. Uh, this um, is the kind of radial distortion plot. Um, there's very low distortion in this system. Uh, there's about a 2% lens geometric distortion or two and a quarter percent here in the corners of this image. And uh, so uh, this is just an example of our um, report. And uh, I hope you like it. Um, there is um, links. Um, if you download this PDF uh, presentation, there's links to all the targets in, in there on this page. And um, we really hope that this uh, uh, webinar was uh, useful to you, a good use of your time. Uh, and um, you can go and view our medical solutions uh, webpage at imatest.com slash medical uh, for more details. Um, you can contact sales at imatest.com if you'd like a quote for any of these items. Oh yeah, here's the QR code if, to view the slides if you missed it at the beginning. Um, you, we also have a monthly newsletter I uh, would happy to have you subscribe to if you're interested. And uh, we've gotten quite a few questions. And so we are going to proceed uh, to the question and answer period now. Uh, all right. And I'm going to actually um, uh, unmute some of the Imatest part uh, participants if they're interested in answering any of these or allowed to unmute them. Um, yeah, so you can raise your hand if you've um, uh, got a question. It looks like Norman uh, is has raised his hand. Uh, Norman Corin, our founder. Uh, did you have something to add, Norman? Oh, just found the unmute button. I want to let people know that we can measure a very important uh, parameter called information capacity uh, from slanted edges like ESFR or SFR+. Plus. It's a new capability. Uh, you can find it on our website. Uh, we're working on standardizing it for general imaging. And I believe in the long run, it will be quite important for medical imaging. Um, we'll have more to say about it in the future, but if you go to imatest.com slash docs and search for information capacity, you'll find some very interesting measurements. I think it's a, a fundamental uh, image quality goodness uh, or figure of merit measurement. That's all for now. There's a lot more. Uh, uh, contact us if you want to learn more. Yeah, I'll get the link here. Um, paste it in the chat shortly. Uh, yeah, and that's combining you know noise and sharpness measurements uh, together from a, a slanted edge. And um, it's quite an interesting measurement. We are in the process of uh, working with the ISO committee to standardize. Uh, those measurements. Uh, and um, so we're ex pretty excited about that. We've got an ISO number for that. Uh, so yeah, it's going to take a long time, though. So, uh, right. Well, we will be actively working on it. <laughs> Standards, uh, everything takes a long time. And that's okay. We're not, we're not going anywhere. So, um, okay. Yeah. I'll find the best link for that and share that shortly. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, if you'd like to, Ask if, if you typed up a question, you'd like to ask it directly yourself, um, raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll just read out the questions that um, some of them have already been answered here, but I'll, I'll, I'll read them out here. Um, so uh, we had a question. Um, does Imitest have the capability to generate lens shading correction profiles? Uh, if not, uh, may this please be taken as a feature request? We love feature requests. That's where most of our features originated. Uh, our flat field module, which is formerly uh, called uniformity or blemish, um, flat field can measure 
profiles of luminance across vertical, horizontal, diagonal cross sections. Um, also kind of patches in the sides or the corners and uh, getting the luminance value or relative illumination value of those, those patches or those cross sections. Uh, I guess it depends what your ISP wants as far as that lens shading correction. Um, I know our outputs have been used in lens shading correction, uh, many, many different systems. And so it's a matter of kind of transforming the image test outputs into the, the format that your, your ISP expects. It would be good if, if you could send the desired format for the profile, that would be very helpful. Sure. And Dan, if you have anything to add, um, you, you can unmute yourself and speak or else I will move on to the next. Yeah, question. I was just thinking of generating like the polynomial or, uh, you know, the surface that would undo the shading that you would then have to, you know, like you said, take it into whatever your platform is to apply however they expect that. Um, you know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we've done a polynomial fit for lens shading correction profiles that would be fairly easy for us to add uh, if it's if this is something you're interested in um, you can go to the Imatest help center open a, uh, a feature request issue there and um, yeah I mean I guess <laughs> due to our backlog of, of those feature requests you might want to do it yourself um, but we are we are always interested in features but yeah if you need it in the short term then um, I guess we do have some ways of accelerating development, but um, probably you want to use our existing outputs uh, to get the fastest uh, results. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, moving on, uh, the next question here. Um, is reflective chart a better method than transmissive charts due to nonlinear losses of transmissive material and the ability to control the light uniformity? Um, so uh, let's see, Ronald, I will allow you to talk if you'd like. Um, so my answer was uh, light uniformity is usually much easier to optimize with uh, transmissive light sources. Uh, those, um, the 95% uh, uniformity is measured, you know, from the center um, to the corner of the light box. And so, uh, but those light boxes or light panels are usually much larger than your uh, imaging plane. And so that 95%, once you take a, a smaller section of that 95%, well, it goes up to 98, 99, you know, 99 point whatever, um, very, um, very uniform if you're using a small portion of that light box. Um, you know, I think uh, you could probably get fairly uniform um, reflective lighting. Uh, the, the, you know, the issue of the, the specular reflections makes, that difficult when your your light is on the optical axis. Um, when you're um, if you can put lights on the left and the right side of your target, uh, you can get good uniform reflective lighting. Um, you know you don't want to put the light behind your device under test because you'll cast shadows in the target. Um, so um, yeah, generally uh, transmissive is where you want to start. And if, if you're not able to use that because of your built-in light source, then you can kind of fall back to reflective and deal with the other issues in reflective chart quality. Um, so as far as this um, non-linear response of transmissive material, this is something I'm not aware of. Um, I would really love to see any references you have about that. Um, I guess what we do as far as our test targets is we measure the transmittance with a densitometer. And for the dynamic range targets, we provide a reference file of what the transmittance of each patch is. And so perhaps we have not noticed this nonlinearity in the calibration process um, because we're just using the reference values. Um, but again, I'd be very interested to see any details you can share about that. Yeah, I was thinking about the uh, chrome on glass uh, target where uh, they, they had mentioned in the presentation that it's it's thick or thick enough so that you don't get any transmission, but that can be changed so that you can get uh, some transmission, but it tends to be uh, 
uh, nonlinear, right. and and it also changes across wavelengths. So I I think I'm understanding now. So I mean, a lot of the chrome on glass processes, uh, you know, including our um, it's not a chrome on glass process, but the, our Visnier target, um, they have a, you know, this unitone density. Um, usually the the black parts of the target have an optical density around four. Uh, so, you know, or cutting cutting off, uh, you know, uh, 10,000, uh, one, one ten thousandth of the light that you're coming into the system. Um, and then the base density is very, very low. So, uh, this this means that you know those kind of targets have very large dynamic range probably larger dynamic range than a usual camera which can send your camera into um saturation so you can you can overexpose the bright parts and um while it, it's you could get a good exposure of one of these really high contrast targets uh it is um if you don't get a good exposure, then you're going to send your 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 camera system into clipping or nonlinear um, operation. So it's not so much that the the target is nonlinear, but it's the target is too high a dynamic range, and then it sends your system into a nonlinear mode, um, and that is really very bad for measuring sharpness because your um, you know if you have a kind of a, a function of your edge that looks looks like this. And you clip it off, it kind of um, it's going to create this cusp, and you know maybe there's some blur in that in that bright area, but it's been lost in saturation. You end up getting a, a a sharpness score that's higher than you deserve because of that. And um, a little bit of a side story is that um, some uh, contract manufacturers figured this out, and they they saw that their um, um, with the high contrast targets, they were getting much better yields. Well, it was because their system was clipping and they're getting scores they didn't deserve. Their current cameras might have been really poor quality, but they kind of found that you can use this high contrast target. And so this is where um, um, I got a little upset about this when they they came to one of my training classes and they're like, "Give me the high contrast target." I'm like, "No, use the low contrast target because that's going to give you an accurate result." Um, so. Uh, Definitely recommend. Uh, oh, last thing to mention for our chrome and glass targets, uh, we have a special uh, process that um, uses a low density chrome. Um, so, um, and that has an optical density of one. Uh, so it's like, you know, one tenth of it's, it's a 10 to one contrast ratio between the, the clearer part of that chrome and glass slide and the um, uh, absorptive or trans, you know, the, the black area of the target. So um, long answer there, but I, I hope that was helpful. Yeah, thanks, that, that was helpful. Cool, uh, okay, uh, let's see. Um, next question from, uh, let's see, Alex may have left. He's been up very late in Taiwan. Uh, he asked about the ISO 12233-2022 standard. Uh, I, um, we are working on the implementation of this ISO 12233-2023. It involves um, these kind of star targets in the, in the corners of the image that allow you to measure sagittal and tangential MTF in the corners. Uh, this is going to be included in our Imitest 23.2 release, which is scheduled to go to beta around the beginning of September to release around the beginning of October. If you'd like to try the pre-release, alpha or beta release, you can join our pilot program at imitest.com slash pilot. Um, next question from Dan again. Uh, oh, okay, Dan was, a. I think uh, we had not gotten to the part about the the ISO 21550. He was answered. He was interested in what you know what chart target is best for a, um, a medical camera uh, that doesn't have a large field of view. I mean, I guess if you if if you don't lose focus at a longer distance, you can use these larger targets for dynamic range testing. Um, but if you do lose lose focus, um, then you definitely need a scaled down target. And um, hope that answers that. Uh, 
Nikki, uh, so the question is, do the test reports, result reports include the raw data that uh, supports the individual test parameter results? Uh, I think we would, uh, along with the report, we would, we would deliver that raw data uh, to you. Uh, so, I mean, the, the report is always gonna be some sort of filtered subset of that data. And, um, but we can also supply the full, um, probably they would be JSON files that we supply or CSV if you really need it. Um, we can uh, supply that along with uh, our reports. Um, Nikki, you are allowed to talk if you have any other questions about that. Um, next question from Michael, how does the Benchtop system software interact with the imaging testing software? Uh, are they independent? Uh, so currently they, they are independent um, in that, um, well, if you have a manual version of the BTS, uh, it does not, um, you know, it's, it's not gonna, there's nothing to talk to. I guess there's the, the distance finder uh, that might have some sort of USB interface. Uh, speak up, Alex, if uh, that's true. Um, uh, it is just a uh, visual readout. Okay. Uh, there is a, uh, as far as the motion control, if you have the motorized gimbal or the motorized BTS uh, variant, uh, there is a, there's a library that you can use for motion control, which is provided by uh, a company called Zaber. Uh, we're also working on an Imitest motion control library uh, for that. Um, now there is, if you have a light box or light panel um, on your BTS, uh, there is an Imitest lighting control software uh, that um, we released a couple of years ago, which allows you to kind of uh, control that light, light source automatically inside of the software, or I should say directly control the light source inside the software. Um, as far as an automated or an API for controlling the light source, that is a work in progress right now. And uh, I think we have an alpha lighting control API that can control light boxes and light panels. Uh, so that covers the motion, covers the lighting. Uh, it is, it is a, you know, getting good hardware software integration is a very important priority for Imitest right now. Hmm. And it is coming soon. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, I think, Maybe just let what I was trying to visualize is kind of like the standard process flow for operating that equipment. Is it you have an interface that allows you to set up, you know, the X position, Y position for like, like let's say we go with the motorized version of it. And it is the software just getting it into a repeatable testing position um, that we, you know, that, that we set. And then we would have to open up the image test software to just run those image tests separately. Um, so I think I'm getting the indication that it's, well, we have to have like two different software open when we use this bench top. Um, but there's future integration with the Imitest software that it'll be able to work on operate yeah, both. That, that's correct. And, you know, I mean, I guess what, what you can do with the Zaber library is once you figure out the positions that you, you want to kind of recall, um, you could, you know, run a very quick Python script that would just move, move the um, motion control to that position, and then and, execute the test. Um, or the, um, you know, it doesn't do things like automatically centering the target based on a feedback. You know, looking at the image, seeing how off center the target is, moving it to the center. So, I mean, that's kind of maybe that's the ultimate uh, thing is when there's a feedback loop. To do that. Um, so, but we're going to start with just, you know, providing the API for motion control. Um, that's, I mean, that's available right now. It's just not, you'd have to call it externally from the software. Uh, I mean, I guess the, you know, the long term <laughs> vision for our Imitest uh, future is, you know, where you have a kind of a, a whole test plan you can set up in the software, run it through a range of distances and lighting conditions and, um, you know, kind of be able to hit one button and have it run, do all these things, acquire the images automatically, detect the charts automatically. You can do that right now. Um, perform the analysis, generate the report, 
right now, a lot of that stuff is manual. Uh, but you know, as we kind of have our next generation image test, it's going to become much more automated. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I think that's the answer questions. I got a couple open questions here. Let me check for hands. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Pratuja, um, question, uh, when does the plan on releasing the micro version of the texture blur target? Uh, this is a great question. And uh, let's see, I don't have the most fantastic answer to it. Um, I guess there is a color film version of the um, the spilled coins uh, texture target. Let's see if I can find this. Um, let's see, spilled coins test chart. Uh, okay, so yeah, this uh, chart, um, you can order this in small size and um, actually, Okay, so right, that was the inkjet version of the target. This is the the film uh, version of the target. Uh, let me make sure that this is the right one. Um, okay, so this this is the um, spill coins for light sources, and um, let me see the size options here. Um, okay, so this is based on the size of the light panel. Uh, so this. Um, smallest size version of this we have is uh, about 230 millimeters by 150 millimeters. Um, there is, um, I'm, so I'm going to pick the color version of that and visible spectrum. And that's the high, high precision color film version of this. Um, now we could potentially scale this down to color uh, smaller sizes on color film. Um, and We'd be happy to do that if you can contact our charts department, charts at imitest.com. Um, we can give you a quote um, for that customization. Um, yeah, just let us know the you know the size of the light panel or light box um, you're intending to use this on, and we can definitely uh, scale this target down. Uh, there, uh, this target is going to be difficult to produce with some of the um, with things like chrome on glass. Um, until we got half stunning and figure it out on Chrome and Glass, which maybe I think we will someday. Um, but um, so film, one of the film targets is probably the best option here. Uh, you just want to be cognizant of the um, the noise in the film becomes visible as you go to a certain level of magnification. And um, that could potentially masquerade as um, texture. Uh, so. Let's see here. Um, hope that answers your question. Um, and the last question we have here uh, for the BTS. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I forgot to unmute you if you had any follow ups on that. Um, let me do that. I can find it. Sorry, yeah, if you like have follow-ups, just answer, raise your hand and hopefully I'll see that. Uh, last question from Yan uh, is uh, the, let me unmute Yan. Okay, so is uh, for the BTS, is, if a camera has a non-zero direction of view, is the rotation tilt adjustment done manually on the Y-axis of the scope side to compensate? If manually, is there an option to motorize this adjustment? Oh boy. Okay. Um, this is probably best in Alex <laughs> answer. Um, there is motorization of the Y axis or sorry, we had motorized X axis. Um, I guess uh, if, I, can, I can go ahead and answer that. Go, yeah, thank you. Um, so the y-axis we do call the vertical axis, um, but if you have a non-direction, non-zero direction of view, um, we have a small uh, tip 
uh, tilt and rotation stage, which is manual, and this is plus or minus uh, two and a half degrees of tilt. Um, and then we also have um, our plate, which allows for a 30 degree and a 70 degree adjustment. So if, if you have an angled tip that is specifically 30 degrees or 70 degrees, um, that would be a manual uh, swapping of plates uh, to achieve those two um, angles. And then if you're within those two and a half degrees, uh, you'd be able to achieve that with the uh, rotation and tip stage. There's always options uh, to uh, motorize and to customize our fixtures. Um, if you have specific needs, um, please reach out to us at sales at imitest.com and uh, we can accommodate your specific needs. Um, these are all you know, pretty standard optomechanical components that can be swapped out for uh, customized components. So hopefully that answers your questions. Great, okay, um, that was the last question. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, um, you feel free to raise your hand. I'll um, give it a minute before I close down this webinar. And I also owe Norman a link to our information capacity uh, measurements, which I am getting right here. Um, yeah, so there's a, there it is. Uh, okay, so I've just put that in the chat. Um, that, that's a whole uh, deep dive into information capacity, um, a video version of it on the top. And then there's a, um, some, papers uh, down below uh, and documentation on that. Um, okay, I don't think I see any other questions. So I really appreciate your time and uh, uh, everyone have a great rest of their week. Thank you.